For the last 20 years, the world of console gaming has been shaped by three major players. Generation after generation, these systems would be reincarnated to do battle and preserve the very balance of the home system market. The totality of these champions would create this, the Triforce, split into three distinct parts. Xbox the Powerful, PlayStation the Wise, and Nintendo the Courageous. Xbox rules with the brute capital of its lineage. Powerful heroes, powerful hardware, powerful plays. It's had its stumbles, but this unstoppable force hasn't let itself be tethered by its mistakes. No, it's pushed forward with nothing but 12 teraflops and a dream, and has managed to be an industry leader not only in hardware and software, but in its services as well. If the Xbox is an unstoppable force, meet the immovable object. Consistently beloved in every generation, the PlayStation is all about making smart choices. It's heralded for its exclusive IPs, especially when it comes to mature, single-player experiences no other console seems to be able to provide at this staggering level of quality. It turns out, people who buy home consoles want great video games, and PlayStation knows this better than anyone. The final piece belongs to the underdog, Nintendo. Never seeming to directly compete with the other titans, Nintendo isn't famous for its powerful hardware or genius decision making. Rather, it's carved out a place on heart, soul, and the Nintendo seal of quality alone. Both relishing in its past and reinventing the future with design choices no other company is willing to make, at its best Nintendo captures what it meant to be a kid who, in the rawest way possible, just loves the magic that comes from playing games. With its most successful home console in the Switch, more people than ever are singing the praises of an underdog that just one generation ago was on the brink of catastrophe. Thing is, those boons I mentioned, heart, soul, and the Nintendo seal of quality? Well, I actually think those are the least present they've ever been. Instead, I see greed, laziness, and incompetence silently creeping in while everyone else seems to be cheering. I seriously worry that if Nintendo doesn't get held accountable for the decisions they've been making lately, that my at one point favorite company will venture too far down the path of no return. Welcome to Boss Rush, this is my hit piece on the Nintendo Switch. This video is going to briefly cover a lot of games. I think there's more than enough evidence presented for the points I'll be making, but I want to quickly mention a handful of games you won't be seeing in any of the upcoming sections. These games, while not perfect as art, don't have the same type of flaws as products as other games I'll be talking about today. They're good examples of complete experiences. I just know people would try to call me out for not mentioning them anywhere in the video, so here they are, these games are good. These are the games I just haven't played. They could be perfect in every way, or killer examples of incompetence I could have used to make my points later on, but without playing them I can't really comment. Finally, these are the games that I did not enjoy, but on reflection I didn't think I could judge fairly because they really felt like they weren't made for me. In an attempt to be somewhat objective I decided to just leave them out. With these exceptions in mind, most of the big Switch games will be covered ahead, so let's get started. If you ignore the ability to play in handheld mode, the Nintendo Switch is almost, without exception, the worst system to play multi-platform games on. The two Achilles heels of the multi-plat problem on the Switch are hardware that released struggling to keep up with last generation's consoles, in some case consoles from two generations ago, and the worst online service of any modern system. Doom and Doom Eternal are considered miracles for their performance on the Switch. While Xbox Series X plays Eternal at 4K 60 frames per second, 1800p at 120 FPS, and offers ray tracing options, the dock switch will dynamically adjust between 720p and 540p at a mostly stable 30 frames per second, which is probably a bigger problem for a fast paced action game than resolution. On release, Doom 2016 could drop all the way down to 360p with considerable frame dips as well. Full multiplayer lobbies can be unplayably laggy, the Joy-Cons cannot be optimal for playing mechanically demanding first person shooters, and with all of this in mind, was released at full price a year and a half after its initial release on consoles, where it was already selling for less than half of what the Switch version was asking. People consider this port impressive, I consider this impressive. 
Panic Button did the best possible job, everything considered, keeping the feel and presentation faithful to other platforms by making only intelligent sacrifices. This is probably the reason the game is full price. It took a lot of time and effort to get it running this well, which is a premium you will be paying as a Nintendo customer. If this is an excellent Switch port, then what does a bad one look like? Arc Survival Evolved on release ran from 360p to below 200p in docked mode at less than 15 frames per second. It literally looks like a dulled painter's swatch. It looks like spilled food coloring. It looks like you put an industrial fan in the paint sample section of a Home Depot and took a picture while all the cards were airborne. Even booting the game up was a monumental process that could take multiple minutes. Bloodstained Ritual of the Night, Saints Row the Third Remastered, The Outer Worlds, Troll and I, all examples of games that suffered enormously in presentation, stability, and playability in their Switch ports. Pillars of Eternity was completely broken, riddled with bugs, crashes, and performance issues that made the game literally unplayable. WWE 2K18 is outperformed by a fucking PlayStation 2 and can barely handle two people being in the ring at the same time. Two people in a wrestling game. You would need to be playing jerk off mode to have fewer than that. How did this happen? No other yearly game in this franchise would make it to the Switch. FIFA Legacy Edition is still running on the same engine other platforms had in 2016. If you think FIFA doesn't do enough between releases in general, then sorry to tell you the problem is somehow even worse here. Look at the promotional description of the game. FIFA 22 Legacy Edition will feature the same gameplay innovation from FIFA 21 without any new development or significant enhancements. Well, what did that game add? FIFA 21 Legacy Edition will feature the same gameplay innovations from FIFA 20 without any new development or significant enhancements. Hmm, FIFA 20 must have had some big updates then. FIFA 20 Legacy Edition will feature the same gameplay innovation from FIFA 19 without any new development or significant enhancements. And FIFA 2019 was already mechanically and technically behind the curve, only seen as acceptable because of the disaster that was the 2018 release. Payday 2 launched out of date, suffered the same performance issues that plagued all the games I just talked about, and then was dropped by the developers who continued to support the other consoles for a few more patches, making this the most outdated version of the game, minus the last, last-gen ones. By the way, this game released at full fucking price, when the base price was already way lower, and regularly on sale on every other platform for under $20, under $10, and for 5 million copies was literally fucking given away for free. I could go on and on. By the way, every single one of these games that has online, and many more that weren't mentioned, also suffer from the fact that the online service is so relatively bad. Base Switch Online may be half the price of its competitors, but the Xbox 360 had a better service. Even if you're playing a game where the technical quality of online doesn't matter somehow, the subpar communication services, like voice chat without the phone app, I mean, that's just what a phone does anyways, or parties, makes playing with other players a tedious experience. This creates a looping black hole filled with the lost souls of dead online games, where the bad hardware and online infrastructure, the player's disinterest in a bad online experience, and the developers abandoning the games ASAP because of player disinterest all feed into each other and exacerbate the individual problems even further. Many games don't even come to the Switch if not because the system can't run it, but because they know the online will be dead on arrival. Now, obviously all of this started with if you ignore the ability to play in handheld mode. This is a huge selling point for the Switch. It's almost impossible to quantify how much that's worth, and I can see for some people, rarely for myself, I play mostly docked, it can absolutely make playing some games on the Switch a relatively equal or even better experience. I spent a long time debating whether to pick up Monster Hunter Stories 2 on Switch or PC, performance or portability, and ended up getting the Switch version. Even though I made that judgment that the Switch was bringing more value to this game for me, it didn't take away the negative experience that frame drops and performance issues brought to my playthrough. If I didn't need the convenience, I would have undoubtedly enjoyed the PC version more. When looking at the games themselves, you're paying the same full price, not handheld game price, full price, and sometimes more than other consoles are selling for, objectively, the worst versions of these games. And in many cases, versions so bad I don't care how much you value playing handheld, they're unacceptable. I think the fact that software on your system has massive problems that are exclusive to your platform and are being sold for full price is not the best look, but this is only the first nail in the Nintendo coffin, now with a carrying handle. I realize Nintendo is not directly responsible for a lot of the issues these games have on their system. 
I also realize this isn't new. Nintendo has always lived and died, well, really just lived by its exclusive IPs and games, which is why I made this whole section ripping on the multi-platform games. To highlight how important it is that these upcoming first-party franchises are extremely high quality, high effort, and high value. When I went on a tour of Nintendo's headquarters, they gave me an exclusive look at cutting-edge technology they were using to develop games for the Nintendo Switch. They called one of the machines the port a potty lovingly nicknamed for its ability to shit out half-assed ports, remakes, and collections on the Switch. Before I rip through some of these games, I need to paint a picture of industry standards, and what good value looks like from a developer and consumer point of view regarding these types of releases. The Spyro Reignited Trilogy is a gorgeous set of remakes built from the ground up of not just the first, but the first three Spyro games. Careful consideration went into making sure a balance between preserving the old games and making them enjoyable in a modern age of gaming was struck. New, beautiful animations, models, and textures were brought into stunningly rebuilt environments, quality of life gameplay changes smoothed out the experience, and an updated soundtrack was added with the ability to switch between it and the original. This game retailed for considerably less than full price, $49.99. Same story for the Crash Insane Trilogy. Faithful to the original products, rebuilt visuals and audio, quality of life gameplay changes, as well as big gameplay additions that don't hinder the original experiences and simply add to the value of the package. Three revamped games in one, all for the same bargain pricing. Rare Replay has maybe the best presentation of any video game collection ever, featuring 30 games from developer Rare lovingly included alongside behind-the-scenes content, presentation and emulation options, additional remixed gameplay challenges and playlists, a package-wide achievement and progress system, and more. This game was $29.99 on release, which has dropped even lower, but would still be an incredible deal even if it remained at its launch price. The Master Chief Collection did have a rocky technical start, but even from the get-go included the first four numbered Halo games, two more would be added later as fairly priced DLC, with ODST being free for early buyers, and superb collection-wide integration of all the games. You could seamlessly swap between titles, which were the best versions of each release available. The Anniversary Edition of 1 and 2 that let you swap in real time between old and new presentation styles, and a performance enhanced Halo 3 and 4. You could also play playlists of themed missions from across the games, like all stealth missions in the franchise back to back, or all escape or final missions in a row. This was the same for multiplayer, Slayer and Halo 1 to capture the flag in Halo 3 without leaving the lobby. The game was well worth admission from the start, but a price reduction, or free on Game Pass, and the many free content updates make this game one of the best deals on a collection to this day. The Mega Man Legacy Collection has Mega Man 1-6, with both options for modern quality of life technical tweaks and retro settings to simulate what playing these games would traditionally look like. It also includes a save state feature, a challenge mode, a bestiary of all the encounterable enemies, concept art, and more. This, again, released at a discounted price, and as I write this video, is on sale for $12. There are more games in the same vein covering the rest of the Mega Man series, and since October 1st, 2018, a 30th anniversary bundle has been offered featuring Mega Man Legacy Collection 1 and 2, Mega Man X Legacy Collection 1 and 2, and Mega Man 11, that's 19 fucking games, with at least that amount of content doubled in extras for the price of one new game. And I bought this entire bundle on sale for $40. Maybe you think these games, and many more I didn't mention, are the exceptions to the rule. They went way above and beyond what was expected. The Nathan Drake collection is much closer to the industry standard when it comes to remakes and masters and collections. It has the first three Uncharted games, with upgrades to the resolution, textures, models, and frame rates for all present titles. All games have had updates to their gunplay, which, with the change to 60 frames per second, makes the gameplay experience far superior to their original releases. This game received minor criticism for a lack of extra content, but three games competently brought to modern standards for the price of one new release cemented this package as being great value. The Bioshock Collection, all three games updated to current-gen technical standards, with all single-player DLC content included and a bonus making of video for the price of one new release. Like everything else here, you can find it for a third or a quarter of that price today. The Arkham Collection, the Ezio Collection, the Mass Effect Collection, the Devil May Cry Collection, there is a near unplayable amount of remade, remastered, or collectioned games that offer acceptable to exceptional value for what they're asking. Despite the multi-platform problem being present, 
The Switch does have examples of this too, like the Borderlands Legendary Collection that in my opinion you can justify purchasing at full price. Nintendo themselves aren't even a stranger to this. The Metroid Prime Trilogy belongs right up there with everything else I mentioned. All three phenomenal Prime games, updated and standardized with the control scheme from Prime 3, which was the best in the series, tweaks on the technical and gameplay side, and an included art book, the Prime Trilogy was one of Nintendo's best efforts at a meaningful re-release. The Prime Trilogy was priced at $64.99. On the Switch, Nintendo seems to prefer to re-release individual games, so what are some good examples of that? Final Fantasy VII completely reimagines the original to the point of not really even being a remake anymore, but an excellent modern RPG that both new and returning players can appreciate. Resident Evil 2 Remake stays much closer to the original vision of the game it's based off of, but puts so much work from the ground up into doing that, that it sits pretty close to what the gold standard for a faithful remake should look like. Shadow of the Colossus rebuilds brand new and improves, but doesn't reinvent an already excellent PS2 game, so it appropriately retailed for less than full price, which is very fair for what you get. Some games, like Dark Souls Remastered, improve the game, sell it for a fair price, and additionally offer a discount for players who have purchased the game already, which is a practice I really, really like. Funnily enough, on other platforms, which were more used to being treated fairly than Nintendo customers, there were complaints about the cost of this remake despite it not even being full price. I disagree with that, I think it earned its tag. For games on the Switch, I went back and forth on if I should include Bayonetta 2 in this section, or the more unpleasant section coming in a second, because it's nearly identical to the Wii U version, but it came with Bayonetta 1 included and they're such great games that today it gets a pass, but I could probably have different things to say tomorrow. Also, Monster Hunter Generations Ultimate is kind of just a port, but the way Monster Hunter games release and the amount of content in that game, I, I'll give it a pass too. So, that was a lot of praise for games mostly unrelated to Nintendo exclusives. Don't worry, that's the point. It's time to wade through the corn and carrots and see how much effort really went into the Switch remasters, remakes, and collections Nintendo is shitting out, and if you can honestly argue that it lines up with what the rest of the industry defines as fair. Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze is one of the best platformers I've ever played. This game is worth full price, full stop. When it was released on the Nintendo Switch, one console after it was originally released on the Wii U, it retailed for the full $79.99. The kicker? It cost at the exact same time on the Wii U, $20. Not only that, but the Switch version ran at less than 720p in handheld, and had the same frame rate docked as the Wii U version. The only real gameplay difference is the inclusion of Funky Kong, who functions as an easier mode. This is probably cooler to me than it really deserves to be, yeah Funky Kong is sweet, but it's not much in the way of improvements. The Wii U version also mysteriously disappeared from the Wii U eShop pending the Switch version's release. Interesting, but I won't speculate further on that. Does this sound like the same content quality cost ratio as the games I praised before? Pikmin 3 Deluxe was re-released on Switch at full price, after having been, again, $20 on the Wii U eShop for quite a while, with changes to multiplayer and some light additional content. It also runs very slightly better, at the same resolution as the Wii U version, 720p, when docked and below 600p handheld. Am I ungrateful for expecting a full price remaster of a relatively short 2013 game to at least run in HD across the board? Not full HD, 1080p mind you, just regular HD, or at least have significant extra content to make up for it, which is a solution I absolutely would accept. Nintendo could have bundled all three Pikmin games together with updated controls for the first two, and with minor improvements you would only hear praise from me. This game's original release made great use of the gamepad, making the Switch version not even the definitively best way to play. New Super Mario Bros. U Deluxe is a full-priced port that, as bare minimum credit, comes packaged with its sizable DLC, Super Luigi U. The base game on Wii U released at a price point many people found hard to digest even then. The new series has become sterile and flat. New Super Mario Bros. 2 is another example of this, and really fails to hold up to any modern platforming greats, like Celeste, Rayman, or the Donkey Kong entry I spoke of before. The minor gameplay additions, like Toadette as an easy mode character, yes Nintendo, that's what we needed to make this easier, doesn't do anything to alleviate this. The DLC, Super Luigi U, is the one saving grace, putting a timer on every level and making them more of a mad dash than the slow and sulking trod the main games have become. It's not perfect, I don't even know if it's great, but it says something that any small breath of life into these games' formula feels like a big deal. Having the DLC bundled in here and not available for purchase on its own, which you could do at a time on the Wii U, make this a mediocre re-release with no substantial additional content at a deluxe price. 
Mario Kart 8 Deluxe was ported from the Wii U, with DLC included, a few extra characters, a third level of drift boost, and a battle mode. This is the one I'm most on the fence about because the DLC was great value on the Wii U and it's bundled in here, and the bonuses in the Switch port were pretty good overall, especially the battle mode and King Boo. This guy rules. I hate that a huge part of the roster is garbage characters. I hate that everything is unlocked from the beginning. This could be a toggle for players that want progression. I hate how they haven't just super speed bros this franchise. I mean, imagine Samus as a racer with Metroid carts and tracks like the Zelda and Animal Crossing DLC. And I seriously think if you're going to port a game from last generation, you should really be aiming for above and beyond every time. But overall, this one might be okay. The base and added content is still really good, which is the same way I feel about the DLC for it. Just over $30 for 48 new tracks, which is a metric fuck ton, seems like really good value. The thing I didn't realize at first was that remastered tracks from the series history actually means remastered tracks that have already been remastered for the mobile Mario Kart Tour are being ported over to the Switch. These tracks look significantly worse than the game's base or Wii U DLC content and so far have a fairly low hit percentage of great tracks, probably partially because they had to be simplified for mobile play. Does this make it bad value? Not necessarily, 48 tracks is 48 tracks, but the inarguable quality drop in DLC for a full priced port leaves a sour taste in my mouth. I at least port over some of the characters from Tour as well. Pokken Tournament Deluxe is a port of the arguably overpriced Pokken Tournament on Wii U. The game was lacking in content at release and would go on to fall 4 characters behind the arcade version. When ported to the Switch, it caught back up to the arcade version and had a unique character, Decidueye. Other very minor gameplay additions and boom, $79.99 full price port. Not only do I not think enough value was added to the original to justify a full price tag, the high cost of entry and the fact that it's a fighting game, which tends to need good online and support from the developer to really succeed, means this game, like many competitive Switch games, died quick. Miitopia was another example of a game that originally released with a poor cost to content ratio. A simple but decent RPG where a good chunk of the fun comes from equipping your Mies and seeing them interact would have been a perfect handheld title in the $15 to $25 range. Instead it was released at a gouging $50. The Switch port adds minor content, new ways to customize Mies, a few new enemies, a horse ally and so on, and is going for $64.99. It is considerably more expensive than the game that it's a port of, which is already overpriced, while adding the bare minimum amount of additional content. Skyward Sword HD is a port that does more than the bare minimum. It does the bare minimum to be acceptable, but that does sit above the bare minimum, period. Graphical updates are considerable this time because the game is coming from the Wii and not the Wii U, and gameplay changes are thoughtful, speeding up areas that really bog the game down, lots of quality of life fixes, and the ability to replace motion control sword swings with stick inputs. I like the motion control, but I'm happy there is an option for players that didn't. The reason this is the bare acceptable minimum is because these changes have been the most popular mods in the Skyward Sword community for years. On emulators, you are literally three clicks away from using the HD textures. I'm going to repeat it a few times in this video, but impress me Nintendo. You're asking full price for this game, don't just do what you have to, blow me away. You will notice a worrying trend of fans being able to mod existing games or design fan games involving Nintendo IPs that have 10 times the amount of effort and thought put into them, and the quality reflects this. Something more sinister than the state of this remake is that a Loftwing amiibo was released at the same time as the game for $30 that allowed you to access features in the game exclusive to the amiibo. You would be able to venture between the sky and world below without needing to return to a bird statue, which, while not a super major feature, is a super major convenience. You are charging $79.99 for an okay port and locking features that could have been in that port to make it more valuable behind another $30 paywall, bringing the total to $110. This game feature behind limited time, limited quantity physical DLC then get fucked by scalpers is a disturbingly bad practice, and whoever made this decision should be abducted and returned to whatever planet they originated from. Another funny observation, the original game released at the end of 2011, where you could buy it bundled with a limited edition Wiimote and a soundtrack for $69.99. This version of the game, priced at $79.99, also released with a limited edition controller set for an extra $100 and no soundtrack. I know inflation plays a part here, but come on. I'll tie the other Zelda remake in here, which is Link's Awakening. 
This one seems like a remake in the Resident Evil 2 style, faithful but completely rebuilt, which is kind of true. There are some minor content additions and a severely underbaked Super Zelda Maker prototype, but the game really missteps in modernizing the original outside of the art direction, which may be divisive in itself. It feels more accurate to describe it as a visual reimagining. And I might be alone in this, but a new can of paint does not make an $80 remake of a Game Boy game worth it. I think you could find the original cartridge and a Game Boy to play it on for less than the cost of buying this remake. Really feels like this could have been priced like a new handheld game. If you disagree with that, reflect on the Ocarina of Time 3DS remake. Also completely rebuilt for that hardware, this version looks incredible, seriously a lot of work went into the presentation here, but it also has smart gameplay adjustments and included both the original and Master Quest adventure and a new boss rush mode. A full-sized console game remake plus extras all for the handheld price of $49.99. Xenoblade Chronicles Definitive Edition is more of the same bullets shot from the same gun. It's a Wii game that now plays at 720p and below docked and 540p and below handheld. It makes the idea of calling some Switch ports remasters sound a little too grand for what they actually do. The small gameplay changes make it the best way to play the game, but nowhere near a steal at full price. Is the work they put in here really comparable to a JRPG remake like Final Fantasy VII, or the value of 10 Kingdom Hearts games in their definitive editions re-released for $50? Those are truly impressive. Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl are unadventurous remakes of 2006 DS games. The game looks good enough, I'm not going to rag on the chibi art style, that's a stylistic choice, but the omission of platinum content and a failure to fix the problems the generation had in the first place like pacing, Pokemon variety, and TMs is a more objective failure. Compared to Heart Gold and Soul Silver, Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire, or a million fan ROM hacks like Renegade, the remakes don't do enough improving of the originals to justify their near $100 Canadian price. Platinum is still the best official way to enjoy the fourth generation of Pokemon. Super Mario 3D World Bowser's Fury and Captain Toad Treasure Tracker are a pair with similar problems. Ports with enough changes to make them the best version of the game available, not enough to make them good value ports. Both games look and run better by slim margins and feature small gameplay updates to the core experience. 3D World offers a full add-on which is nice, but the new content is a single play area that feels like a repurposed abandoned Super Mario Odyssey level. That might be a little cynical, it's new content which is what I've been asking for and it's okay, I just don't think it goes far enough. Captain Toad removes 3D world levels and replaces them with Super Mario Odyssey levels, which confuses me. Why couldn't we get both sets of levels if you're asking for the same price as the Wii U years later? They also removed the Cat Mario and Peach in every level and created a DLC exclusive to the Switch version. Keeping in all the content from the Wii U version and packaging in the paid DLC as free content at launch or as a free update later would have gone a lot further into making this a good faith effort at providing value. Instead, it actually costs more to get the complete edition of this game than the original was at launch, and the differences just don't make that make sense. I saved the worst of this section for last. This one should be the best value in the whole list. Instead, it's the most infuriating culmination of lazy, greedy, and incompetent Nintendo has to offer. Mario 3D All-Stars is a three-game collection of some of the 3D Mario games, 64, Sunshine, and Galaxy. All three games, well, two and a half, Galaxy is a bit messy, are being emulated. That's right, not ported, emulated. All the games use AI upscaling to increase the quality of some of their textures. Mario 64 runs in 720p with the original 4x3 aspect ratio at 30 frames per second. It has no anti-aliasing, which was available in the Nintendo 64 version. Fans have both created ROMs and reverse engineered the source code on PC to offer full HD, widescreen, 60 frames per second, and free camera options. The Switch absolutely has the capability to do this and instead takes the quick and easy route of choosing to emulate the game with microscopic improvements instead. This is one of Japan's wealthiest companies. They can do what a handful of unpaid fans can. I believe in them. I mentioned the camera before, and that among other gameplay hiccups can make Super Mario 64 feel its age. I'm disappointed we see no improvements to the game itself. The version being used here also patches out the backwards long jump, making this release difficult to justify even for speedrunners. It doesn't really bother me, but shows Nintendo really gives no fucks when it comes to trying to please their fans. Super Mario Sunshine is seeing its first release since its original run on the GameCube, and runs at a more impressive 1080p 16x9, but still at 30 frames per second. Like 64, fans have made all of this possible in emulation, which Sunshine is using, but have also got the game working at 60 frames per second. 
On release, it did not support the GameCube controller even though Smash already did, and so pressure sensitive functions of the Flood were instead bound to two buttons. Additionally, there was no ability to invert the Y axis when using Flood which was seriously annoying, and unfinished elements from the developer version of the game were still left in. Super Mario Galaxy also gets a boost to 1080p, dropping based on how demanding the game is at a given moment. Some technical issues to the presentation aside, the game mostly looks great. It always looked great, so that's not new to this collection, but a win's a win. The Pro Controller slightly improves certain sections of the game, but not being able to map the cursor to the stick, especially in handheld, requiring you to remove your hand from the controller to touch the screen, is baffling considering the Nvidia Shield port of the game is already able to do that. It's worth mentioning all three games have updated HUD elements that are just good. They look good and some have been smartly resized and repositioned, which is sadly the biggest gameplay change in the whole collection. There's also a sound test on the main menu, which feels like tacked on extra content for an anniversary collection. Guess it made copyright striking all those YouTube channels worth it though, right? So let's review. Why do I hate this game? Strike 1 is the overall laziness, especially concerning Super Mario 64, but visible in all three of these releases. They never once went above and beyond to make these versions of the game seriously stand out, even when fans have been able to do it for years. This is doubly funny when you consider Nintendo's stance on emulation as a whole, like, no wonder you're so fucking bad at it. Strike 2 is the lack of Galaxy 2, the best 3D Mario game, when it was on the same system as Galaxy 1 and meets the theme of this collection completely. The omission of Super Mario 64 DS, 3D World, and 3D Land are more understandable, but they could have helped fill out this game, making it feel like a complete package instead of a phone-in. I have a bad feeling Galaxy 2 is coming later as a full-priced individual remaster. The final strike is one I haven't mentioned yet. 3D All-Stars was a limited time release, physical and digital. A limited physical release can make sense, but a limited digital release is only there to pressure customers into making a purchase out of fear of never being able to buy that product again, especially when this is the first time Sunshine is available to play outside of its debut. It also means that it never really needs to go on sale. $79.99 for three games ranging from 15 to 25 years old with no effort towards doing what fans have made available for years. This collection is probably the quickest buck Nintendo has ever made, and honestly, what really made me open my eyes to the declining quality and value of Nintendo products. Am I painting a picture here? I feel like the only people who still fully disagree with this section are not understanding the point I'm making. Let me address what some of you may be thinking. I'm not necessarily criticizing the quality of the raw games on offer here. Like I said, some of them are fantastic. What I am criticizing is the added quality and value of the port, remake, whatever that typically justifies new price on old game. To me, Majora's Mask is a 10 out of 10. If it was released on the Switch identical to the N64 version, in theory that wouldn't really change. But an industry standard exists. Developers and consumers seem to have a bar set as to what constitutes a fair release. Can you say in good faith you wouldn't find anything wrong with that port of Majora's Mask being $79.99? I mean, it's still a good game, right? Who cares that it's old or was $10 on the eShop years ago? Some people might get more specific and say a lot of these games are from the Wii U, and because that system was such a flop, these are basically new games. If we ignore the cases where that's not true, and we ignore the fact that it's a bit of a spit in the face to Wii U owners, I still disagree with this. Many kids growing up today have never played Majora's Mask. That means it's basically a new game too, right? I know you don't agree with that. And maybe if we concede somewhere in the middle, the Wii U games are a lot closer to modern standards than N64 ones, it's still not a game developed for the Switch even though they're full Switch price, the work was mostly done, and some of them are coming up on 10 years old. These business practices just don't line up with the rest of the market, it's either laziness or greediness or both. The only other contention specific to this section would simply be that you disagree with my assessment of the individual quality of these additions. Even if I'm wrong, let's say some of these do live up to the standard of a good release to you. I've provided so many examples with evidence, come towards my side, even just a little. There's no way I'm completely off base here, and we've still got one more set of games to cover. These are the big ones, the prize winners, praised as being some of the best games of all time, literally bringing critics to their knees, making them and their mothers cry, the Switch exclusives. This section will get me the most hate, but I genuinely believe there are more examples of the same three problems, laziness, incompetence, and greed on display in many of these offerings. I'll start with a slam dunk before I really get people riled up. 1-2 Switch was seen as the Wii Sports of Nintendo's modern console. A tech demo, fun at parties or with friends, that was both an entertaining piece of software and a way to reel in new potential buyers. 
Unlike Wii Sports, this game was not packaged in with the Switch and retailed for $79.99. This is maybe the worst deal in the history of all gaming. 1-2 Switch has enough content for about 1-2 plays before it reveals itself as a shallow gimmick with no real staying power. 28 mini games. wow, that's way more than the 5 Wii Sports had, except the games here don't go much further than Cradle Your Switch Like a Baby, Beat Your Chest Like a Gorilla, Quick Draw. There is some fun to be had here, especially with new groups, but the novelty wears off so quickly, and the lack of real content means packaging this in with the Switch at 10 to 15 extra dollars would be the only fair way to sell this game. It blows my fucking mind this is still over $60. This one is priced so wildly, I don't even think rabid Nintendo fans would disagree with me here. The actual Wii Sports of the Switch, Switch Sports, sings the same tune. Released five years after the Switch, it has half the game's Wii Sports Resort had at six, which is still only one more than the base Wii game had 16 years ago. Most of the sports here are okay, but there's never really enough going on. Tennis is the best example of this because it feels relatively unchanged from the Wii version all those years ago, and a mechanically excellent tennis game already exists on the Switch. All of the sports, except for Special Mode and Bowling, which lost the 100-pin challenge, suffer from meat and potato syndrome, a lack of extra features. The physical release comes with a leg strap to use in soccer, except that's not true, it's for use in a shitty soccer minigame, with integration into the actual soccer mode being patched in Autumn 2022. There's only six fucking games here, and they couldn't even be bothered to finish them all. Adjustments to the rules or point limits are bare bones. You can't even do it in badminton or volleyball. Little exists in the way of special challenges or training modes, which Wii Sports and Resort had, and you're stuck playing in the same bland stadiums and environments. This is no woohoo island. Like I said, the actual games themselves aren't all bad, but even the best don't entertain for more than a few hours of play. The unlockables and customization here are skeletal. Don't worry though, you can unlock some custom gear by playing online. Not only do you need to be paying for online to get access to this customization without being severely bottlenecked, you earn random items off of a timed rotating set. The format of this is so sketchy for a game with an underwhelming amount of on-cartridge content. This gear needed to be earned in some sort of structured single player. Also, golf will be coming in a future update. This doesn't feel like a bonus, this feels like patching in a sport that wasn't finished for release. I think by then most people have moved on, mourning the $64.99 that didn't go as far as they hoped it would. Super Mario Party and Mario Party Superstars share the exact same problem, a serious lack of content. Super Mario Party has three boards and an extra unlockable one. Four boards in total. The first game on the Nintendo 64 has eight, double the amount of boards. And this is when Mario Party was not an established formula. This is beyond unacceptable. The minigames on offer here are pretty good as an individual entry, but a lack of unique modes and oh my, I can't get over the amount of boards. I think some people stomached it thinking free or even paid DLC was coming, but no, that never happened. This game seriously had four boards, that's less than the original DS version, and not even all of them are great. The ally and unique dice systems are cool ideas that I liked, but the fucked up economy and lack of content make it impossible to really get much out of them. This game also has no online play for a home console multiplayer board game. Oh wait, that did get added in an update. Three fucking years later! Mario Party Superstars was the next release, and a return to the style of the N64 Mario Party games. Not just spiritually, it's literally a collection of remastered boards from the first three games and minigames from across the series. Maybe this is charged with some bitterness from the last release, but then why are there only five boards? These are all remakes. We couldn't even get a second board from Mario Party 3. People will justify this by saying that's only one less than the average Mario Party game, but guess what? Those games didn't have enough boards either but at least as the series went on, they became more interesting and complicated as an excuse. Your game that's remaking boards shouldn't have less boards in total than every individual game you are remaking boards from, games that were on the Nintendo 64. This is gonna sound like the port section, but you should be aiming to impress. Imagine if they remade five boards from each game and doubled the mini games. Is that a crazy amount to ask? I don't think so. I think it would be a product you can feel good paying $79.99 for. It just feels crazy because we're so used to getting served scraps. The character roster is lacking, and there are no costumes even on boards that originally had costumes, but there is online play and a few quality of life changes, like CPUs being able to take over AFK players and adding turns mid-game that I really like. This is undoubtedly the better of the two Mario Parties on the Switch. The developers hit their target, they just aimed really, really low. 
Speaking of Mario games that aim low, please welcome Mario Tennis Aces and Mario Golf Super Rush to the firing wall. Tennis Aces has a bit of a redemption arc, but that doesn't excuse its release. A barebones 5 hour adventure mode literally missing an introduction cutscene that would be patched in later was the majority of single player content available and it was far from excellent. Mario Power Tennis on the GameCube had a robust cup system, where three cups were available which would unlock the pro version of a character who could then take on the three advanced cups. There were also two gimmick cups and cups available for doubles play. This was on top of the regular story, free play, tournament, and minigame modes. Even in comparison to the N64 version, Aces is lacking content. The game seemed to put a heavy focus on its multiplayer, where a ranked online mode wasn't available from the start. For local multiplayer, you couldn't even directly pick a stage, and still to this day cannot set the rules to a full match of tennis. You can't play a full match of tennis. Why? It's just a change in numbers. It would be unfair for me not to mention the improvements that came with time. Even though they were drip fed over months and months, a substantial amount of new characters were added to the game. New courts, missions, and other similar content was also added over time, including a cosmetic system that worked by grinding a few items in month-long rotations. These cosmetics seriously needed to be rewards for single player modes included in the base game. It's also worth saying, the core gameplay here is fantastic. It's one of the best sports games I've ever played. There is a great mixture of ease and depth, of speed and strategy, and of mechanics and mind games. If the gameplay here wasn't superb, the pittance of content at release would solidify this game as a total disaster and an absolute ripoff. In its current state, it still feels like it's got a few holes but you could definitely justify a purchase. I just think that should have been true on release and not years later. Mario Golf Super Rush unfortunately follows the exact same arc, up until the full redemption. Let's play a game. On the 3DS, Mario Golf World Tour had 10 courses at launch. How many do you think Super Rush had, a home console release with a home console price? 6. Barely over half the amount of base game courses, and three of them were some variation of boring, plain, and green. Overall, in terrain and obstacles, they are some of the most bland courses in the history of Mario Golf. The adventure mode borrows from Tennis Aces. It's an underwhelming 4 or 5 hours that feels rushed and tacked on. The highlight of adventure mode for me was Cross Country Golf, which had you playing multiple holes on an open map in any order, with a stroke limit. This mode, if the mechanics were as well done as Toadstool Tour on the GameCube, could have been a game changer, and would have done wonders to fill out the game's content on offer. Cross Country Golf is limited to a few adventure mode missions because, of course it is. The other modes besides regular golf are Speed Golf and Battle Golf. Speed Golf was a huge focus of the marketing for this game, and to me really falls short. Especially before multiple patches, the run to your ball while fighting Mario Kart style sounded fun, but ended up playing out like a spam your dash move and then walk when you have no stamina simulator. There isn't enough depth here to make it worth playing more than a few times, and certainly not more than the main form of play. That's a shame because the courses in actual golfing have been seriously simplified, I suspect to accommodate this mode. Three press golf, terrain maps, visual information, everything has been watered down mechanically from the GameCube release, seriously hurting the depth of the core gameplay. While the roster of starting characters wasn't so bad, the quality of character animation has seriously taken a dip. Take a look at the difference in animation quality between this game nice part. <laughs> nice part. <laughs> and the 3DS and GameCube versions. Don't tell me it's because of Speed Golf either, that mode could have used shorter animations while Standard Golf retained its full quality. Finally, Battle Golf is a fun idea, maybe because it's like cross country golf light, but for whatever reason you can only play it on one single arena. Again, if there was more meat here this could have been a great addition, but one course will burn you out of this mode pretty quick. This game also received post-release updates, the most important being an extra 5 courses. These courses were also so much more interesting than the base courses that I seriously wonder if they were meant to be unlockable from the start and just weren't finished. This brings the total up to 11 courses after DLC, which is better, but is only one more than the base 3DS game, which has 16 courses after its DLC and also ends up being cheaper than Super Rush overall. 
A few extra characters and mini modes, nothing too substantial, rounded out the free content. While I do think this deserves some credit, Nintendo is getting increasingly comfortable releasing full games that are either unfinished, or if the definition of that word bothers you, lacking in content at full price. Neither of these sports games were finished at launch, neither of them earned the Nintendo seal of quality, and customers are lucky that any content was added because they could have been left out in the cold, like owners of Super Mario Party. I've heard people call this game Mario Golf Super Rushed, but to me it's all just Mario Golf Super Worrying. This finish it later mentality is actually pervasive throughout the Switch library, especially with the sports games. Kirby Star Allies got all of its best content injected more than half a year after release. The base experience on offer was uninspired and simple, with bland level design that scarcely challenged the player. Only recently did I revisit the game to find that guest star question mark question mark question mark question mark Star Allies Go mode was filled out with interesting dream friends that added fun replayability. Heroes in Another Dimension showed off difficulty and complexity in its level design that I wish was on display in the base game, and a secret extra difficulty was added to the boss rush mode that reshaped bosses into real fights rather than walking health bars that melted faster than a stick of butter on my dash in the Texas sun. I don't like that I'm finding this out years later after I fully completed everything available at launch. Monster Hunter Rise had to have the end of its main story, seriously like the conclusion to an already pretty short campaign, added in at a later date, alongside endgame Elder Dragons that should have been packed in from the start. Even now, after all these updates, Monster Hunter Rise feels a little short on content. It might be the lackluster event quests or the reduction in environmental complexity from Monster Hunter World, but this is the quickest I've ever finished with a Monster Hunter game. The post-launch free DLC felt like it was catching up to an unsatisfactory release date rather than keeping the momentum going in an already full experience. ARMS heavily relied on core gameplay to justify its price, but there wasn't enough content to keep players engaged to that gameplay, just like the sports games. Five characters would be added, fighters that would have rounded out a more impressive base roster. I'm glad some work was done to try and justify the launch price, $79.99 doesn't make sense pre or post free DLC unfortunately, but playing catch up doesn't work for high entry cost multiplayer games, you really need to stick it from the start and then keep players interested with additional content. Compare it to other big name fighting games like Mortal Kombat 11 and all of its single player and multiplayer modes and it quickly becomes clear what I mean by this, just don't buy the Switch version of MK. Speaking of fighting games, let's talk about Smash Ultimate. Don't worry, I'm going to pump the brakes here. Smash Ultimate is absolutely worth its price. In fact, it's a shining example of what doing your best to not just meet buyer expectations but exceed them looks like. Do I think pretty simple changes could have been made for the better? Yes, especially when it comes to aspects of competitive play. I don't understand why small mechanics or rule adjustments that fans are already able to mod into the game can't be in the official version, even as a toggle, to satisfy both the casual and pro side. Also, little stuff like a boss rush people have been asking for since day one don't seem that hard to implement. I understand Nintendo just doesn't seem interested in appealing to a certain part of the Smash fanbase, and that's both extremely disappointing and acceptable I guess because the final product is still great. Smash Ultimate does have one serious objective fault though, and that's its online. The options for and quality of online play is the worst of any acclaimed fighting game I've ever seen. Even if the omission of a good rank system is intentional, fuck you, the quality of matches in general is horrendous. Constant lag makes battling online look closer to a PowerPoint presentation than a video game. Did they really hate competitive play so much that issuing the takedown of streams, running free fan developed mods that gave an old GameCube game the best online of any Nintendo game ever, made by one person, wasn't enough, and they needed to make sure that nobody could enjoy a competitive match of any Smash game online? period. I mean, party or fighting game, this shit feels terrible. I swear nothing has improved for Smash Online since the Wii. This dysfunction is not limited to Smash either. It's a cancer that comes from Nintendo's core gaming philosophies. In the modern day of gaming, nobody cares about playing online. It's just a fad, Nintendo says. Sure, okay. There are many first party games that really get held back from their full potential, Mario Maker 2 for example, by an unplayable online service. Even flagship multiplayer games like Splatoon 2 suffer from amateur online implementation. The match quality isn't always as poor as other Nintendo titles, but it's clear they really just fundamentally don't understand why people like to play competitive, even casual competitive online games. Meta changes ability to communicate and party up easily, rankings, ease of use, etc. They handle it all so disappointingly. I swear other developers would kill to get the eSport ability of some Nintendo games, and yet they just refuse to lean into it at all. I said I wouldn't mention it, but completely casual games like Animal Crossing New Horizons are still affected by these attitudes. It should be 
the easiest it's ever been to visit. Visit is a good word because there's shit all to do there. Other players, and you still have to do five minutes of song and dance just to get to their island. An island that has to be shared by every user on that Switch, so you need not just a new cartridge, but a whole new console for another family member to have their own save. I mean, it's so ridiculous. Okay, I said I wouldn't talk about it, but fuck this game. When it comes to online play, Nintendo is out of touch. Out of Touch Games, by the way, should be Game Freak's new studio name. Let me set the stage real quick. Nintendo is one of Japan's wealthiest companies, and Pokemon is the biggest franchise in the world, in the whole world, of any franchise ever, on Earth. There should be no reason, no excuse, for why Sword and Shield are not just some of the worst entries in the Pokemon franchise, but just bad games in general. Some of us have been waiting since childhood to get a proper Pokemon game on home consoles, and while that might mean expectations would be difficult to meet, these games don't even come close. The presentation here is shit. Flat, dull, uninspired, technically appalling, am I describing the environments, the Pokemon models, the animations? You pick, I'll just answer with yes. Famously known as Dexit, this generation is the first to not have all Pokemon available. There is a world where this makes sense. The monster lineup is getting huge, and I can see it being very difficult to provide a high quality experience that includes every single Pokemon. If not now, eventually this would be true. This is the exact reason that was given in an interview when discussing the cuts. So why the fuck are these the same models and animations already made for the 3DS? Colosseum, Gale of Darkness, even Stadium had Pokemon that looked and animated better, not just for their time, but even sometimes when directly compared to the newest game. This is the most lifeless Pokemon battles have ever looked on a console. We left our boys behind for this. Those Pokemon that got cut, by the way, can be moved into a paid service, Pokemon Home, where they can't go back into their original games and they can't go forward into Sword and Shield. They're stuck in Pokemon Purgatory with a Poke Gun held to their head demanding you pay your subscription fee or else. A take it or leave it mechanic in Dynamaxing that replaced much more interesting systems like Mega Evolving and Z-Moves, a story filled with constant interruptions made for children that even they find boring, and a competitive online that has been eclipsed, more than eclipsed, the moon is grabbing the fucking sun and RKOing it by an online battle simulator for over 15 years. Puzzling design decisions and technical ineptitude is displayed around every corner in this game. You can't even change your audio settings without getting this in-game item from a random NPC. Why is the world's most financially successful franchise pumping out games with the quality of a first-time indie developer? I seriously think Pokemon needs to pull a Sonic Mania and hire some ROM hackers because individuals are thoughtfully crafting entire adventures, alone and unpaid, that make this game look like a joke. Fuck every company that has a say in these games. If a genie said I have one wish, I would without taking a breath, without skipping a beat, ask for Pokemon to become public domain, so that competent developers could could get their hands on the core concept I love so much. It really does just disappoint me. I'm getting so much secondhand embarrassment, I think we should just move on. Pokemon Legends Arceus is a step, a little bitty little baby step, in the right direction. I am pleased with the shift in format, not because I dislike the old battle mechanics or formula, I actually like them more, but because it shows the developers are putting some effort into making a worthwhile product. Unfortunately, either technical incompetence or an uh, accelerated release schedule make this more of a tech demo or proof of concept than a hearty full experience. A flat, literally and artistically, an empty world riddled with the same technical issues Sword and Shield have again make this iteration of monster catching feel like it's coming from an amateur startup studio, not one under the same umbrella as teams who worked on games like Breath of the Wild, which had worlds that were better looking, running, and more interesting. It doesn't help that Arceus feels like a game that's really relying on its open world to keep you interested. A developer's prohibition of engaging content, lifeless Pokemon that drone around with drool hanging out of their mouths, and a sluggish grind of an endgame make this the third full price Pokemon game on Switch to be asking for way more than it's worth. I won't argue that New Pokemon Snap is in the same league as these two Game Freak titles, it's not, it's a hundred times more competent, but ask yourself this, does this game feel like 22 years and 4 home consoles away from the original? Is this truly worth AAA exclusive PlayStation or Xbox price? Or like Mario Party, are we so used to mediocrity that this just relatively feels like a great release? I don't want to hate on this game too much so just think about that for yourself. Paper Mario the Origami King is the love child of stubborn and traditional Japanese businessmen and talented and passionate developers. This game looks amazing, the aesthetic is truly gorgeous, but following in the shoes of Sticker Star and Color Splash instead of the Thousand Year Door or even Super Paper Mario, the characters and story are disappointingly new Super Mario Bros. 
Complex, unique companion characters and winding narratives are washed away and replaced with sterile and generic Mushroom Kingdom munchkins, and stories you could sum up in a sentence or two. I don't care who's responsible for this, Miyamoto, Tanabe, my own grandmother, someone is out of touch with what the fans of these games want, and what would objectively make them more interesting. It's so funny because I feel like the individual programmers or writers or whatever don't like this philosophy either. So there's this rule. I don't know how firm of a rule it is or where it comes from, but it exists in some way that characters in these games aren't going to deviate from their image across the rest of the Marioverse. There is a Bobomb who introduces himself as Bobomb because having a name would be too distinguishing, who in what feels like an active developer rebellion is called Bobby and other fun nicknames by Olivia, another one of Mario's allies. By doing it this way, the player can latch onto a name, a shred of personality, Bobby. But the developers can say, no, don't worry, Miyamoto, Bobam is his real name. The glorious recognizability of Mario holds strong. This is ridiculous, and while Nintendo's overall philosophy of gameplay first can be refreshing, not here, the battle ring sucks, story and character have a place in video games. They used to have a place in this very series. You know what? Let's just go full David Goliath and sling some rocks at the two untouchables of the Switch library before wrapping this up. I think both of these games are complete products, so this isn't completely in line with the major theme of the rest of this video, but I don't think they're the flawless masterpieces they seem to be regarded as, and they don't carry the Switch library on their own. I think it would take feature length videos to fully make my point on these games, but I thought leaving them out would make it look like I was just ignoring their existence, so here's the synopsis of my complaints with them. Breath of the Wild deserves the praise it gets for its open world. Kind of. Imagine being a kid and on a random Thursday in August, your parents give you a big, beautifully wrapped present. There's this feeling of mystery and excitement because with genuinely no idea what's inside or what it's for, you can imagine anything being inside. The precious moments between being given this gift and opening it are in themselves exciting. Understanding this feeling is one half of perfecting the open world game. Most people will just call it exploration and it refers to the game's ability to excite and entice and provide a constant state of present opening where you never know what you'll find but you're really happy to just be looking. This is the half Breath of the Wild does so well. It seems like you can't go five minutes without organically running into something that draws your attention. But if exploration is one half, substance is the other. Substance is what's inside the present. No matter how magical it was to see that big box and wonder what it contained, the reality, the actual answer to your ponderings, will probably have a bigger impact on your impression of that day in the long run. If it was something awesome or you've been wanting it for years, Congratulations, it's likely you'll fondly remember this moment in your childhood for the rest of your life. But if it's just a pack of gum, yes, the excitement was worth something, but the disappointment of substance will retroactively bring the entire experience down. This is how I feel about Breath of the Wild. It's true the design of the world piqued my curiosity around every turn, but what I actually found underwhelmed me. The small handful of powers you're given during this tutorial plateau are what you have to work with for the entire game. Hundreds of Korok seeds, over a hundred shrines, and all the main dungeon content will use this small handful of tools on loop. And it's not just a lack of progression in abilities, but the design of the puzzles using them don't evolve either. Shrines are the main form of content in Breath of the Wild, and they feel like they were designed laterally. What I mean by this is most shrines are equal and could be placed interchangeably in the world, probably so players could run into them in any order without getting stuck. This is good for pacing the first 10 or so shrines, but then seriously degrades the quality of the other 90% of shrine content. Nothing in these identically boring looking mini dungeons evolves past using the same one or most two powers in the same handful of ways over and over and over. This might not be the silver bullet it is if the rest of the structured content was really good, but the dungeons in this game are the least plentiful and smallest and shortest and lamest they've ever been in the entire series, which means that boring shrine puzzles make up a huge percentage of structured content in the game. Despite how full of meticulous detail the world is, in a way it's lacking content, just a certain type of content that I would argue is necessary in a game like this. Combat, whether against mooks or bosses, consists of the same set of simple enemies reskinned, with the only real exception to complexity being the Lynels. Damage calculation is broken by a system that adds and subtracts flat numbers for weapons, enemy types, and armors, making towing a tender line the difference between taking a quarter heart of damage and ten hearts of damage. Even if that wasn't a problem, Santa's endless sack of food, inconsistent dodges, breakable weapons, and more bring the whole experience down. I don't think this game will be remembered as fondly as other Zeldas once we get some distance from it. It's a huge recipient of recency bias. If Breath of the Wild 2 can improve the structured content while keeping the world, I think it will completely overshadow this game and prove my point for me. I said Breath of the Wild nailed half of its formula. 
I think Super Mario Odyssey gets like a sixth right. Mario of little surprise to anyone feels great to control. I think the base moveset here with all the Cappy moves is the best of any 3D Mario game. And that's where my list of positives end. See, Odyssey is so obsessed with quantity over quality that I truly feel I wasted more time playing this game than I spent enjoying it. There are hundreds, like multiple hundred, that's not an exaggeration, of pointless power moons in this game. Some are just sitting there with nothing around them. Many you get for just talking to characters. Most are obtained by performing the same tasks again and again across Odyssey's worlds with no differences. Some moons are given for getting moons. Some of them actually feel like they know they're wasting your time. Kick this rock 50 times spit coins at this plant for two minutes. The filler in this game is endless. The complexity of the worlds and objectives stay stagnant for the entire time. I truly feel like you could rearrange all but the last two kingdoms into almost any order and it would feel about the same. The game doesn't respect your time and it doesn't respect your skill and it rubs that disrespect in your face with a song and dance jerking itself off. I'm pretty sure Odyssey is a game made for children. Not just capturing child magic but enjoyable for everyone like Pixar movies, but actually designed from the ground up to be enjoyed exclusively by someone with the gaming sensibilities of a young child. I'm sorry if that sounds snooty and you are certainly allowed to enjoy it, but the universal praise this game gets from critics and adult fans really baffles me. I want to end this section with a prediction. It's going to date the video a little bit, but while writing this script, Mario Strikers Battle League is the most recently announced first party Switch game. Having only seen the trailer, I'd like to make a few guesses about its release. I think it'll be a full priced game with a fun core gameplay loop. Because it's next level games, it'll probably have good character animation, but it's going to lack structured content, so either a four or five hour adventure mode or a cup system like Mario Kart alongside a bare bones free play mode. It'll have a disappointing amount of characters or stadiums or items or all three, an online with way less features than a game relying on online play as part of its core value should, with lag and the promise of free or paid DLC shortly after release, possibly on a schedule, to include characters, modes, or stadiums that should have been in the base game. It's possible that not every single point here will be true, and I hope something changes and the game is great, but Nintendo has clearly stated its definition of a complete game throughout the Switch's life so far. If you think there's nothing wrong with this list, I've seriously failed to make my point in the video. If you agree with me and think that more than a few of these points are unacceptable in conjunction with each other, then take a look into the state of this game at release and really think it over for yourself. Does Nintendo respect you and your money? Games are at the core of today's video because Nintendo has never been a perfect company. From the handling of copyright strikes on videos and streams and fan projects, to shady Joy-Con warranties, and a paid expansion of the shitty online that delivers poorly emulated games people have purchased two, three, four, or more times already, and I suspect is going to be used to sell you the missing parts of full-priced games as free DLC in the future, people are used to Nintendo missing the mark. The software has always been the flex tape holding back consumer dissatisfaction. That's what makes all of my criticism so unfortunate. The number one response I get when being critical about Nintendo is, Nintendo's a business. If they can get away with it, they will. It's a good business decision. I 100% agree with you, pretty much every business out there has profit as their top priority. This isn't necessarily wrong, but it's also not something we have to tolerate. We are their profit. If they release a port for full price with minimal effort, don't buy it. If they release a game starving for content with a promise of future DLC updates, don't buy it. If they refuse to listen to your concerns about online play, don't pay for online. Or do, but realize you're just hurting yourself. You have the ability to change the way Nintendo does business, and that's by using your wallet. A good middle ground for even the biggest Nintendo fans is to buy these games used. If you know something about a game is shit, but you really can't resist the purchase, please find a secondhand copy so Nintendo doesn't see a cent of profit from it. And look, I know I was being very negative during this video. That was kind of the point. There's a lot to love about Nintendo and its games, and I want it to stay that way. But every year they become a little less Mario and a little more Wario. Thanks for watching my first video. I know it was a bit all over the place, but I hope I was able to get my points across clearly. For more similar content, subscribe to my channel, like the video, and leave a comment if you don't mind. And a uh, big thank you to all my Patreon supporters. You're really helping me make this content happen. Now go on, get, get out there, play some video games.